this. And I think this will just kind of summarize everything that we talked about a little bit today. But I, I call this the four plus magic questions that patients want answered. Okay. And the reason I say plus is because I certainly, I don't have all the answers. And there actually could be other questions that you guys may have actually picked up, you know, early in your careers um, or that you've heard from mentors that actually work beautifully. Okay. But if we kind of go through these quickly, you know, you know, do you know what is wrong with me? And I loved it when you, you guys all wrote this before, like what are patients expectations on day one? Do you know what's wrong with me? Okay. And this is actually where we have our opportunity to establish our expertise. Okay. And to be honest, Think about it this way too. You may not know that day what's wrong with people or patients coming through the door, but the reality is you will figure it out. Maggie, when was the last time that you had a patient walk through your door and you were like 100% sure that it was like this? It was, this was the problem. Mm, I try to avoid that. Sometimes I, I find myself assuming that I know exactly what's happening, but I have to catch myself and take a step back. Yeah, like, it, and here's the interesting thing. We all have sort of our clinical patterns and we've done this for, you know, a few years, probably longer than most of you. But the reality is, is we don't always know the answer. It's about how do you come across still though and portraying yourself as the expert? And it's actually okay to still try to work through that in upcoming sessions through. But you, we all have a general idea of what's going on with the patient. And we can still establish expertise, even if you're not really sure, was that special test positive or negative? probably tell you it probably wasn't that relevant, but, but anyways, that we're not here to pick apart our exam. But the most important part too, is you've got to be able to build rapport and trust. And I think the number one thing that a lot of us struggle with early in our careers is that you don't build enough trust with the patient and you just don't have enough time with the patient to actually help them achieve that goal at the end. So if you focus early on establishing rapport and building trust, it'll allow you much greater opportunity to establish that expertise, okay? You trust me, you guys have the clinical skill to actually manage these patients, but go back up to how do you hone in on those other skills, those power skills, when you start to be able to check off all those little those bullet points about why those patients are coming to see us or what do they want um, from their clinician, okay? Next question, am I going to be okay? This is that whole piece on reassurance. But in order to be able to reassure a patient or validate their concerns, right, or understand their beliefs, establish those expectations, you've got to give them enough time to tell their story, okay? And again, the, one of the things that I remember Jim Millard will always teach is, I think it's, Maggie, correct me if I'm, hopefully you may know this too, it's either eight seconds or 18 seconds before a clinician will interrupt a patient. It must be eight. 18 seems long. Right. So again, it's our challenge to kind of check ourselves in those in all of our assessments to make sure we're giving the oh perfect. Thanks, Mike. Um, giving the patient enough time to tell their story, following up with more open-ended questions. Okay. But again, this whole thing around am I going to be okay is the reassurance part. Okay. So at the end of your assessment, you have to be able to check up. Did I did I communicate to the patient that I know what's wrong with them? Did I behave in a way or did I establish myself in a way where they know that I know what's wrong with them? Was I able to reassure them before that 45 or 60 minutes was up? And then do you know how to fix me? And remember, many of you said at the beginning too that people are coming in for that fixer approach, right? You know, what's that quick fix? And this is what I'm gonna challenge you with. Is I'm not a big fan of the fixer approach anymore. I moved far beyond just saying like, you know, my manipulation is gonna fix. Do I still do that? Sure. But the reality is, is I'd rather you guys think about this a little bit differently, okay? Because we don't have to be the fixers and evidence is moving away from that, okay? Instead, try to address what can I as the patient do to make it better, right? So our job is also to educate them. What can they do to actually help progress their condition, okay? What can I as the therapist, or if I'm speaking to you guys, what can you as the therapist offer to make it better, okay? So again, they're going to ask, how, how are you going to fix me? But try to work that backwards. What can we do to support this process, both for them as an individual and for us as the provider? And interestingly, maybe this whole thing isn't even about a, an actual intervention that day. This is maybe about us providing more coaching or facilitation or cheerleading. That's a key piece. Okay. 
and there's lots of consumer reports out there and surveys and CPA just did one where there's actually a very big component from, or from the patient side of the survey that said they're actually looking and they see the value of physiotherapists as coaches and facilitators of their, along their journey, okay? And this is the most important one I actually think, right? Because I think the other ones tend to be a little bit more natural for us and we can actually adapt quite quickly. But this is the one that's uncomfortable for us. What is the plan, okay? And actually to a patient, what is this gonna cost me? And for us as therapists, we automatically go to, how much is this gonna cost me? What's the financial limitation? But interestingly enough, time is the number one reason. When you look at tons and tons of clinic data, that patients do not come for their full course of care. It's not money, okay? Another key component is it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time, to be honest, when you think about it in a week when they're homeschooling kids during a global pandemic. Okay. Okay. So again, just don't get fooled by cost, but they still want to know what the plan is. Okay. And this is sort of what Maggie asked the great question to kind of build on Maria's there is we have to be comfortable. And this is where having an on site mentor or having somebody that actually can support you in your clinic is so important because how you overcome barriers is by including the patients in shared decision making. Okay and actually making sure that you can bring up some of those difficult, you know, those uncomfortable conversations. Is there a barrier that would stop us from moving forward? What do you think we could do to fix or to, to resolve this? What can you and I do together? How would you, uh, you know, how would you consider adapting this plan? No one's gonna say, you know, I don't know, but the reality is patient-centered care requires shared decision-making. If you go back to the slide we showed previously, it's about collaboration. And there needs to be a little bit of autonomy. And one of the things that I want you guys to leave with, because Jim's not here tonight, but Jim says we spend a lot of time working with patients, but we should spend more time working or walking towards patients to realize that we're actually here to support them. But in order to actually build that trust, we actually have to gradually take steps towards the patient. Okay. Making, and many of you have seen some challenging cases where it requires pretty significant behavioral change and modification. But here's what we're gonna end with tonight. You guys have to be prepared and accepting of yourselves that you have the skills that you need, but at the end of the day, you are your best treatment technique and you are your best caseload builder. So I can share with you guys a whole bunch of other strategies and tactics, how we use treatment plans and all sorts of like tactical things to do. But it, first and foremost, you have to realize that the way that you interact, connect, and demonstrate your empathy to those patients is how you are actually gonna grow your caseload, okay? So just before we do our giveaway, cause I know we're over time as usual, maybe we should have just made these things 75 minutes say. Um, but I wanna leave you guys with this, cause I think it kind of summarizes this section nicely, is you know, what have we learned from the pandemic? And we've been sort of using this slide since we came back you know, from the first lockdown. And it was really about thriving, not just surviving, okay? And what we know, and this is why I'm actually quite excited to do this talk to you know, the younger clinicians, is we have to continue to be innovative and embrace tech. And Maggie gave us a really good example of, of how, you know, in partnership and through you know, the tech world, we're not going to be replaced. We all, we all agree upon that. But there is going to be a way to make things more efficient, more effective, more affordable, expand our outreach. But we actually require tech to do that. Okay, and this is the one thing that I'd love for you guys to really think about how you can utilize these two components. How can we be in a high tech world moving forward for 20, if you think about 21st century healthcare, okay? Remember, I did a talk, some of you may have probably heard me talk about this at Western today. I literally did a talk two years ago about virtual care at a different university. Professor was not happy with me. And then literally a year later, we laughed about it because we're like, holy shit, the whole physio profession is virtual right now, okay? But the other key component to this that I want you guys to think about is high touch. And high touch does not necessarily mean that it has to be my hands on a patient. We just did a significant amount of high touch during that first lockdown when my hands were tied behind my back and I could not touch the patient unless they were emergent case. But the interesting thing was is that we were still able to drive high, high value. So think about it from high touch points, okay? May in person, maybe virtual, may even be a, just a gentle phone call, could even be a handwritten letter 
to congratulate somebody on a milestone, okay? We are gonna be, start to see a world where we're gonna have to give more value to patients than ever before. So in the past, I'll give you a typical example of what we see in clinic. People would have been six weeks, 12 weeks before, you know, in another practice, not getting better before they would have come to another clinic. We actually were seeing that now way early. People are trying clinic two, three visits, not getting any better, boom, they want a second opinion. So again, you can already see the, the need to drive value quick early is actually changing. But interestingly, when you actually compare some of these movements, it's not clinical skill. It's just about the experience the patient had at that location. And I think it was you, Logan, that mentioned above, you had some family members that changed even a clinical location because of the experience that they received, okay? Again, we have to be patient-centered, and I still think we're moving into more of a relationship-centered model, okay? And location agnostic, again, this is sort of what Maggie is sort of sharing with us, you know, before and looking at just what happened in the industry. Location agnostic is us being more available to where the patient wants us available. Do I need to treat them at their home office? Do I actually need to treat them at their work office? Patients may not be able to come to my brick and mortar facility the same way that they did before. We've seen that during this pandemic. So having the ability to think creatively and outside of the box to, can I bring therapy to patients? And it doesn't necessarily need to be home care either, right? Still a viable option. But again, this is what we're starting to think about when we're moving into this thriving new world, okay? And again, Maggie said a beautiful, so I'm just gonna quickly leave that point there, but just the ability of looking at how are we bridging the divide between the physical that we all do quite well and the psychosocial aspects of health? And again, looking at tech is certainly going to be a great opportunity for us to actually bring the psychosocial side of things as well into the mix. Not to say that we don't do that in clinic, but what we did experience is that we were actually able to actually really focus more on that when we went into the virtual world. Okay. And I do think we have to think always about how do we, with a patient, co-create a fun environment as well as drive value simultaneously, okay? I'm not too sure I have that many patients that just love coming to see me in clinic. Most people come because they have an issue. But the reality is, is how do we, with them, make it entertaining and still drive value that they're willing to come back and see us so they can get back on that stand-up paddleboard, they can get back to yoga, whatever it may be, 